Hi friends and welcome to Talking with Tennis People. My name is host Eric and in this episode I'm going to be discussing the very pertinent issue of why Dave's superpowers or where more precisely Dave's superpowers is wrong. Now as you see I made an outline for this video beginning with the metaframe and that's what I'm going to start with which is the illocution. My goal here really is to execute this with as good of an effy approach as I can. I want to stress that I don't... So in order to do that, I need to begin with a lot of disclaiming. Uh, I've seen plenty of this... I've, well, not plenty. I've seen a few of this guy's videos. And by and large, I find them interesting and well-made. And a lot of stuff he says is right. So... Regardless of that, however, there's a presentational approach to making something like this that's pretty critical. And this really is all motivated by a comment somebody left that that elicited a, a strong response from me. And I'll see if I can find the comment. There's one. I know her, she's excellent at typing. Also, she was typed confirmed by Dave Shannon Powers, OP. But you ignore that, and first of all, I didn't know that when I typed this person. Obviously, I have no idea who typed who. And pretend you know better just for the effect. Maybe you find a way to become respected without always calling out others' flaws to make yourself look better than them. That's cheap. Okay, well, um, there's to me. The, the pertinent part of that, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is the part about Dave superpowers and their being sort of like the, the gold standard or something. So my goal in this video is, and it certainly involves winning that, winning that narrative because I want to stress that I do understand them better, that his model has got problems and that I've got good cause to position myself as the authority on these things. That's a controversial statement to make and it's something that only a field like this really would would such a statement be uh, apropos. Uh, what I mean by that is it's a field about which there's no consensus yet. Uh, Dave Superpowers talks about an objective typing approach, and I'm sure that the protocols he's advocating for of increased objectivity are, in fact, preferable in an, on an, an objectivity scale to the status quo. I'm not disputing that. Um, however, it's important to remember that just because I type somebody doesn't mean they are that type necessarily. I could be wrong. I'm not spending months with the person probably. Um, not that it should take months, but people people display weird when they're under scrutiny. They they deviate from their norm. And the act of doing the metacognition associated with cognitive functions is necessarily going to change how you act itself. You're an open system, so you are subject to changing yourself as you're analyzing yourself. And you're certainly subject to gaming tests and gaming individuals. So having said all of that, it's important to note that regardless of who that person was typed by, that doesn't mean she's been typed correctly. I mean, that would include me. I'm not perfect. But there are good reasons to it's much you can be a lot more perfect about eliminating certain types than you can about about being definitive about certain types um, for some people it's pretty cut and dry for other people it's a little bit more of a tricky matter but I'll say this if you're if you're coming up with subtypes to justify typing people who deviate from a type norm um, in terms of their attentional habits not in terms of their matching of type descriptions, then you're probably doing something wrong. 
So I've had it explained to me this is a certain type of INTJ, and that's why she doesn't act like an INTJ, or blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter how she acts, really. It matters what she reveals about her attentional manners and her attentional habits. So I would make the claim that I understand this stuff better than Dave Superpowers does. He would probably differ from me in that claim. He would probably say, no, you don't. So I'm sure a lot of people out there agree with him and say, no, Eric, you don't. He's got 20,000 subscribers. You've got less than five. So obviously he knows better. People might say that. I don't know. So the purpose of this, then, is to make my case um, that I understand not just cognitive functions, but the ideation associated with taxonomies better than Dave Supervisor does. A note on critiques. When you're making critiques of me, um, if possible, I, I don't like it when this happens. He says... Calling out others' flaws to make myself look better. That's, that would, there's this presumption that you know why I'm doing something. That, um, and that I deserve to be critiqued because of the why, the illocutionary frame. I may not come out right out and say it, but I want to make myself look better, so I'm doing this. That's my real reason. Well, first of all, my motivations aren't really relevant. What's relevant is my, is whether my actions appropriate or not, or my words are appropriate or not. So if in fact I were, uh, I, it is the case that I, were, I was being a bit of a bully in that video, for example, then call me out on that and say you, you were behaving a bit like a bully and it doesn't play that well. Or just, you know, and that bothers me or whatever. But don't presume to know why I'm doing shit. <laughs> It's it's not just you're probably wrong, but it's irrelevant and not a meaningful critique. People are motivated by all sorts of different reasons. What matters is their behavior, their words, their actions, not so much their motivations. What you're really trying to say is, I perceive, perceive in you, Eric, a insecurity that's being masked here um, and compensated for with your bad behavior. Well... Even if that were the case, if in fact my behavior is bad, that's the problem. And to the extent that I don't engage in the behavior, presumably I don't display the insecurity. I'm not saying that is the case here, but you know, regardless, the point is that's not a meaningful critique. So try to avoid critiques like that. Now, this is the marketplace of ideas, the last of the disclaiming. It's meta disclaimers. <laughs> uh, it is the marketplace of ideas, and you know people will do with these ideas as they see fit, and they'll agree with me or not as they see fit. I present my case, hopefully that people pay attention to it and uh, give it give me my due consideration. So uh, okay, let's go back over here. Um, disclaimers, part whole. When I'm critiquing his thing, I'm critiquing some part of it that he's talking about in this video. There's a hole that that fits into, and sometimes you cannot adequately critique a part without understanding how it fits into a larger whole. I've got limited understanding of his full system, so it's quite possible that there's something I'm critiquing that he will have accounted for in some other part of his system that I have not accounted for and thus negates what I'm saying. That's possible for certain things. For other things, it's not going to be possible. But I just want to throw that out there. Positioning as well. Am I positioning myself as uh, more knowledgeable or more correct than Dave Superpowers about this stuff? Yes. Am I positioning myself as a better media maker? No. Am I positioning myself as um, more likable? No. Am I positioning myself as right about everything? No. And am I positioning myself as in contempt of what he does? Absolutely not. So I want to stress all of those things. Okay, actuality. So the reality is we have a a model here or a taxonomy or a system about which there's no broad agreement there's a few different schools their socionics is is improved upon mbti seems to be the general consensus um, but there's lots of different variations of that and different people have their own systems and their own terms and their own whatever and the reason for that is because it is first and foremost a taxonomy it's not a model which means 
it does have model elements if you it well we'll get to it first and foremost it's a taxonomy which says we can name these things whatever we want we're just chopping an existing whole into categories and noting similarities and categorizing them according to attributes or other things like that right <coughs> So there's an arbitrary quality to it implicit. You can divide up that taxonomy in a couple of number of different ways, basing on based off this hierarchy or that, as we're going to show in a little in a second. Um, so there's going to be variation about people's understanding of it. It is first and foremost a rhetorical tool. It is not a um, people want it to be an instrument of science in some regard, but it's not that. It's a rhetorical tool. It's a tool of language that one uses to improve one's understanding of self and world. So until we understand it as it teleologically or utilitarianally is, as its usefulness is, then we're going to have battles back and forth about it. Okay, so that doesn't mean that they're not more objective and more subjective in dealings with it, and we'll get to that in a second, since Dave Superpowers claims to be the one who's dealing with it objectively, okay? Uh, Preframe, conditionality and abstract thought. Because we have conditionality, we necessarily have two passages of time. What I mean by that is I can conceive of what would happen if I did something different. If, in, if I threw this lighter at the TV screen, it might crack or it might just bounce off of it. I'm going to not throw it. Um, that implies a turn-based reality. There's before I throw it, there's when I throw it, there's after I throw it. And the game board, namely reality in front of me, changes accordingly in the various stages of that turn-based understanding of time. There's also a real-time understanding of time, which is what we're experiencing, what I'm experiencing right now, what you're experiencing with listening, sort of, which is the meaning is being conveyed in real time. It's not something that uh, is conditional in that regard. I may be speaking of conditionalities, but the speech itself, the sound making from my mouth is not conditional, it's absolute. And your hearing of it is experiential, it's absolute, and it's in the moment. And any given, the mo this moment now, you're not hearing what you heard before, and you're not hearing what you heard ahead. That's using a time, uh, turn-based approach to time. And you couldn't understand these words if it were turn-based, except by writing them down. Then, all of a sudden, you've got a turn-based approach to hearing words. You can't hear in turn-based because hearing is a matter of frequency and it's, it's an expression of, of time, of energy across time. So as a consequence, there is no, there, there is in fact a turn-based representation of sound, it's called sheet music, you know, but um, you can't experience sound in the same way that you can experience ideas conceptually as a whole without time, you can't experience sound in that fashion. I can't listen to a song without spending the time to listen to it. I can understand a complex concept by understanding its label, its word that covers it, right? So there's different relationships to time with different kinds of objects and processes. Uh, regardless, I can't explain I can't go through absolutely everything, so I'm going to move forward as quickly as I can to get to the cognitive function stuff and the critique, which I haven't even begun yet. Frames. Language versus experience. These are frames you need to account for if you're going to correctly taxonomy human experience, and that's what cognitive functions do. They taxonomy all manners of attention of human experience. So you need to distinguish between that which is language and experience, like I just did, which is a turn-based or real-time um, understanding of time, as I explained right there in B, sequence and time. There's OSO. What that stands for is uh, Observer, Subject, Object. There are three levels of identity. Because of the, the nature of language and the turn-based aspect of time, there are other people who are subjects that are not us, or other people can be objects who are not us. We ourselves can be subject or an object, but we are always additionally an observer, which brings us to the illocutionary frame I mentioned above. What's, what do you really want that you don't say and you don't express externally? That needs to be accounted for in the intentional manner of taxonomy as well. If you don't account for it, you're going to fall short and fail in some regard. You're going to take some shortcut in some other area to try to account for it uh, for realities that don't get accounted for because you've not accounted for the the trinity of, of levels of distinction that there are. Okay, so that's hugely important right there. Now, number letter D, teleology and explanation. Explication. What... 
The way you explain your cognitive function model is going to depend on what you intend its utility for. So in other words, if I'm explaining to you descriptively, here's what, here's how cognitive functions interact with each other. And I'm not linking it to any person in particular. Um, it starts to become very uh, removed from reality in a way that that makes it difficult to understand even. You've got to have some human examples in the mix to describe what it means to have a human attentional manner. So uh, how exactly you're describing the thing is going to depend somewhat on to whom you're describing it and why. And it never gets described except in some kind of a context. So in this context, I'm describing this to people who understand cognitive functions already, at least to some extent, or else they probably wouldn't be watching a, a video about why Dave's superpowers is wrong. Um, and I'm expecting people to be interested in the abstractions enough to stay with me, even though this is pretty dense, right? And I'm hopeful that like a little bit of F.E. meadity me is waving my hands around or something might might help help it go along. And coming back to this roadmap -y, meta framework as well to help tie it all together and make everybody feel like okay I'm I'm with you I know where you're going with this so just to recap so you do know where I'm going in the first section I just did this sort of meta critique why I'm doing it um, and and I my little annoyance with critiques and stuff and noted that this is the marketplace of ideas these ideas will either stand or fall on their merits because they're open to critique because they're all laid out for you so if you want to attack any element of it you can um, objectivity and subjectivity uh, oh, so, oh, I'm sorry, going out of the disclaimers part, I made some disclaimers of how I can't exactly critique him in full because I'm not, I'm not a scholar of Dave's superpowers or anything, but this is, these are critiques based on what I've seen and that they may be a part whole thing where I'm missing it, how it fits in. Uh, and I hope to remember, you remember the positioning and then, uh, so now we're down to um, objectivity and subjectivity. Dave's superpowers claim to have objective typing. Now, I've not heard from him any definition of objectivity or subjectivity, and I bet you he doesn't have one. He assumes everybody knows objective means science-y, and subjective means feelings-y. Um, so, while I admire and, and agree with the inclination that we ought try to make a more disinterested calculus about uh, ourselves and functions and understanding what type we are and stuff like that, a disinterested calculus is not the only factor in objectivity. So when we're talking about objectivity and subjectivity, what we're really discussing is number one, the interested disinterested calculus. And I think that's what he means by it basically is use a disinterested calculus. But two, data that's externally, you know, accessible and data that's only accessible to the person who, who has it inside of them. So feelings are subjective, whereas TI is objective because it talks about words that are accessible to third parties. If I go, that's not true because blah, 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 those words are now accessible to everybody and they can TI critique it themselves. It's an objective calculus on people's reasoning. Uh, so it's important to, to know what you mean by objectivity, subjectivity. And, you know, whether you're referring to data, whether you're referring to the person's deciding process, or whether you're... you're um, a lot of people will say, well, you're not being objective because you're biased. But just because somebody's biased doesn't mean they're not objective. Objective means per, means arguing in the objective realm. And if you have an interested calculus and you're making arguments that are objectively better than the other arguments, what that means is that a third party executing a disinterested calculus would conclude that your arguments are better. Now, if your arguments are better, then objectively you are correct, regardless of your bias. So it doesn't matter whether you're biased or not as to whether you're objective. What matters is whether you're applying an objective calculus. And, are you know, in other words, are you being fair? Are you just as ready to be disappointed as you are to be happy with the conclusions of your calculus? If so, if you prefer to be disappointed and right than happy and wrong, then your ultimate bias is towards a disinterested calculus and you'll be objective. So that's why it's never a good idea to uh, critique anybody on grounds of their bias. Okay, so now let's look down here at attentional hierarchies. When you're talking about cognitive functions and dividing them into a taxonomy that makes sense, you need to account for the following attentional hierarchies. Time, real-time versus turn-based. And then you need to account for universalism versus particularism. 
you need to account for function type, and there are four function types, not two. There are not two, two kinds of judging functions. fi and ti are both judging functions. But why do I say this? Why should you take this claim at better value than other people who tell you there are four kinds of judging functions? Well, because ti and fi are both ways to judge. ti says I'm going to judge against a consistency metric, and fi says I'm going to judge against an authenticity metric. Now, te and fe are not ways to judge. They are ways of interfacing. FE says, I'm going to manage other people's perceptions of me. TE says, I'm going to solve problems myself. Um, you might say, if, to make those parallel, you can see FE says, I'm going to utilize human resources to solve problems, and TE says, I'm going to solve problems myself. Um, FE's concerned is a value with other people's perceptions. TE's concerned is a value with effectiveness or efficiency. So we have, to, we have to account for those things. We have to account for the fact that the judging functions are actually judging functions. The interfaces functions are, are actually interface functions. We have to have another mechanics explanation to, to explain why further, which we'll get to in a second. Um, in fact, there it is next, PGR. When we think about functions, it's, it's good to have them broken down mechanically into sort of the machine code of them. And the best explanation I've been able to come up with and that I've ever heard is the put get receive explanation which is people like individual like servers put get and receive information so if I'm putting information I'm acting if I'm getting information I'm soliciting and if I'm receiving information I'm just it's already been solicited or unsolicited I just receive it so the thing is we have four kinds of functions but only three PGRs and the reason for that is the action functions are SE and NE, and they put information. The, the get functions are TI and FI, and they get information and process, calculate it. Um, the interface, the uh, receive functions are the knowledge functions, NI and SI. They are ways of knowing. And the interface functions, extrovert thinking and extrovert feeling, are ways of interfacing. Extrovert thinking, way of interfacing with uh, concrete systems of the world, the physical particulars of of objects in the world, and it, you know it it becomes something else when paired with introverted intuition. Uh, it's different than when paired with introverted sensing, for example, and of course it's going to be paired with one of those. So uh, the reason is because TE and FE interface functions are always followed up by a knowing function if they're in the dominant slot. And there's a good reason for this. Uh, if you're interfacing, you need to you need to react to the thing in front of you in real time, at least some of the time. And that requires you to know sooner. Now, as action types, we act first me and you know any type any doms se doms we act first and then we judge because judging is the most deliberative or reflective of things acting is the least interface and knowing go together because um, knowing is the intermediate ground between judging and acting and interface is is a is the thing that incorporates elements of all the others so whereas action functions put Judging functions get and knowing functions receive. Interface functions do all three. And you can think, we know this is true by thinking about it. If you think about how you interact with um, in real time, focus on the real time for a moment because that's easier to understand. If we think about extroverted feeling, I might put information. I might come and say, oh, it's so nice to see you. I might get information. I might, How's your daughter doing? I might receive information. I might see the, I might see the person frown and understand that means they're sad. Uh, having good FE means being deft in all three components of extroverted feeling. And most parties who use extroverted feeling are somewhat less than equally deft in all three. For example, Kimberly is much less of a putter than she is of a receiver and a getter. Her interface function pairs with a knowledge function. So it makes sense that she'd be inclined towards the receiving end of things. 
Regardless, that's something that has to be accounted for. There needs to be a mechanics to explain why it is that there are these four different functions. And when you combine them to just judging and perceiving, it's missing the point. The, the reason those two kinds of functions are on axes is because they're complementary. So knowing complements acting and uh, and uh, judging complements interface. What that means is if you it's the it's the helper it's the helper buddy assistant the little sidekick so SI is the sidekick of my NE the the reason it's 1-4 if you have them in the 1-4 is because it's the furthest away from it, it can be still conscious regardless I can't get into all the function mechanics because it's too complicated but at the moment but anyway and, and also it's it gets it gets counterproductively dense at a certain point. The reality is there needs to be mechanical consistency all the way down as there is in this model that I'm presenting to you. But it doesn't need to inform our understanding of functions a great deal. However, if we get certain things wrong, it will, it's like a wobble that gets worse and worse and worse is the farther out you get from it. So we've got to make sure you got all the function mechanics right or else it won't be an effective way of understanding things. You'll you'll be wrong and be more convinced that you're right than you are. So it's like if I'm wrong, uh, I I can be convinced I'm wrong about a given type situation. Usually it's because somebody brings up something I hadn't accounted for, hadn't thought of, and or I can be at least convinced to shed doubt upon it. That's a sign of of a of a good system because it understands its limits. You're not going to get certainty because this is a the best approximation of mechanics we can get into, the best modeling we can do for something that's fundamentally taxonomical in nature. All right, so you need to additionally account for um, disinterested and interested calculus for external and internal l locations, loci, uh, for value metaphors, like how each of them can sort of carries with it a certain habit of valuing, typically, or correlates with that. And then with slot mechanics, frequency and preponderancy. The thing is, first and foremost, you need to remember that your dominant function is the one you used most frequently and for the most of your of your wakeful time is the attentional manner that you're in as a default. Even if you're using some other attentional manner, it's you're, it's swaddled within your dominant function such that um, if there's an opportunity for your dominant function to step in and, and join the party, it will, if it's not contraindicative. Now, if you're talking about an interface function and you're doing interface functions, then you're shutting off your action function during that period of time. So, uh, now granted, you go, you may do FE, 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 and then chime in a little NE and then go back to FE and chime in some NE, and that's typical. But let's say I were in a situation which required me to be really attending by an extroverted feeling, which I can do, but which is tiring and, and takes my full attention to focus on, if I, that's all I'm doing. Um, if it were really important, and the only thing that matters is FE, and I knew that going in, then I would have to shut off my, my action function. I wouldn't be able to spout off extroverted intuition nonsense because it would be contraindicative of the values, goals, and attentional purpose of extroverted feeling, which is to interface well. In some sense, to the extent that we give these these functions identities like that, treat them as entities that have purposes, which is a shorthand for a more complicated explanation, then the purpose of FE is to interface well, which is to manage the perceptions of the other person well. Um, everything else would be in the service of that. So, um, slot mechanics, besides frequency and preponderancy, there's value mechanics, which is to say each slot number is a kind of value such that the dominant is implicit, the second is instrumental, the third is absolute for yourself, the fourth is seeking, the fifth is absolute for other people, the sixth is counter value, the seventh is blind, and the eighth is balanced. Understanding these, how the slots imply not just strength or something that's really clumsy way of describing it like that, but instead a manner of valuation. An instrumental goal is different than an absolute goal. Um, it, I, you know, if I'm if I'm a hitting coach, and 
I want my players to hit well, and they do, then I met my absolute goal. But if I'm the manager, and I want to win games, and the players are hitting well, but we lose all the time, then my instrumental goal is meaningless because I failed to meet my absolute goal of winning games. So understanding the different kinds of valuings that we have is a critical uh, prerequisite to correctly analyzing functions. Uh, it, because after all, what it means to, to taxonomy and model cognitive functions is I want to cr su successfully abstractly represent all of human attention, which is a huge project, right? You've got to account for everything. All right, so let's look down here at I got then. I got is what he talks about here, and now I'm going to critique Dave's superpowers. He says, Ident identity, gather, organize, tribe. So this says, this is the person's self. This is presumably like the observer, right? And this is the observer's behavior actions. Uh, this would be the, the keeping track of part, I guess, or I mean, basically the knowing. And then this one would be about the external social. So the first thing I want to observe is that this is wrong. This is this is wrong, and this is wrong. These are basically backwards. TI doesn't say what works for me. It says what holds water on an objective third party scale. What's consistent linguistically with what we already accept as true or give the status of true to. <coughs> what's consistent with what somebody said before. Those sort of arguments are TI arguments and they're about a disinterested calculus. Not what works for me, but what what works when I extract me from the equation and do a disinterested calculus? That's TI. And it's correctly called TI and not TE because it is introverted thinking. The, the analysis, the logic, is inside the individual person. They are aligned with that approach to problem solving if they're, for example, having a tool function like I do, which means they, uh, they habitually disregard their own feelings when judging something they have to because they have a hammer and the alternative is a nail they never they never use a nail because they're always using a hammer um, that's why we have that's why the tool function defines the polar let me pull bonger okay So, understanding TE and FE require us to not think of them as questions like this, because <coughs> do people actually like this is a fine enough question for FE. <coughs> What's a better question is, does this actually make me look good? Um, but implicit in that is, do people actually like this? For TE, however, the extroverted thinking is is done like so so the feeling is the reason extroverted feeling is done externally is because it's about abstractions of other people's opinions you don't actually know when they f smile or frown that they're happy or sad we presume it we presume the symbol represents a reality we tag the reality with a word and we draw conclusions about the other person's feelings based on our abstractions regarding the data that we see it's external in that regard and unlike TE it's universalist which means it, it measures against the universal scale of you know likability or positivity towards me and perception management towards me I want to be liked I want to be respected I don't want to be disliked I don't want to be disrespected I'd like to be uh, welcomed I don't want to be shunned and etc you know those are basic universals that you compare against with with extroverted feeling with extrovert thinking, however, there are no ex there are no universals you compare against. It's always utilized in regard to a particular problem with a particular solution that's desirable to you. So, in other words, you've got to know what you want exactly to know whether your TE has been effective or not. If I want a bridge that breaks when the first car drives over it because I'm filming a movie and I want to show a scene of a car falling through a breaking bridge, then it's excellent TE to make a bridge that breaks the first time a car drives over it. 
but if I'm making a bridge that's designed not to break, then that's bad TE. So it's always going to be particularist, the TE, depending on what the goal is, because that's why it's linked with FI. You know what you want with FI, you know how to get it with TE. The other thing is, understanding TE and FE means recognizing that there are two fundamental approaches to a problem in the world. And I've come to understand this clearly living with an ISFJ. If you've got polar TE and you've got tool function FE, there's one approach to things in the world, and that is ask Eric or find somebody who knows how to do this. Kimberly either already knows how to do it from her SI, from a long time ago has been shown, taught, or whatever, in which case she does it that way. Or if it's something new and she doesn't know how to do it, she goes, Eric, because she doesn't ever think to herself, I could solve this myself. She thinks, what human resource can I use to solve this problem? And the answer is Eric. So, uh, if, if in fact Dave Superpowers is correct about TE and FE being the way they are, and you might say, well, it's just a matter of, of a disagreement of labels or of, of names, well, then I would ask, why, how is it that TE extroverts them? What's it extroverting on? Are you saying it's worried about whether everybody finds this to be working for them or whether it actually works for them? Wouldn't that be the same thing as don't, do people actually like this? Does it work for everyone? If it works for everyone, doesn't that mean everyone likes it? And if everyone doesn't like it, doesn't that mean it doesn't work for everyone? Are you really drawing a distinction there? So he needs to answer those questions if he wants to uh, meaningfully draw a distinction. I've explained to you what's being extroverted upon. Extrovert thinking extroverts upon systems in the world. So if the doorknob's broken, as it is in my bedroom, it won't latch anymore. Um, that's something I could choose to try to solve myself. I could look at it, I could take it apart, I could see what's wrong with it, I could try to get a new doorknob, there's lots of things I could do. That would be extroverted thinking. I could instead say, who do we know that knows how to fix doorknobs? Cameron. Let's invite Cameron over for lunch, mention the fact that the doorknob is broken, feed him nice, maybe he'll help us fix it, and have the tools right there too, and we would like, be like, oh, I was looking at it, but I didn't know how, and then he'll come and fix it. That would be an FE solution. Okay, but a TE solution would be extroverting not on what works for everybody. In this instance, it's true that the doorknob would work better for everybody if we fixed it. But, um, for example, I have a TE solution that I use in the interim for the bedroom door, not, door so it doesn't swing open all the time. I've got a little metal rod that I drilled a hole in the wood part of here, like where the door goes across here, and I, I, so I slide that through there, and then you can't open the door. That works for me when I'm on the inside of it, and when I'm not on the inside of it, I put it up here high where nobody else can get to it. So it works for me fine. It doesn't work for other people because they can't get in if they want to, and um, if if they're inside the room, they can't use it to lock me out or lock anybody else out, you know, because they can't reach the thing. But it works for me just fine. It's good to eat for me. That's exactly why it's not. Does this work for everyone? So it's an interesting calculus. And the thing is, you you Dave Superpowers would have figured out that he's run afoul of something here if he had realized he needs to account for all these other variables. He can't just account for the variables that feel good to account for and ignore the, the rest of them. So it's got to be consistent and it's got to it's got to hold argumentational water. It's got to withstand argumentational scrutiny. You're welcome to scrutinize my model all you want and attack it all you want and I will successfully defend it against any and all comers. I expect all of my framework and contingent level arguments to be challenged and I'm well prepared to answer those challenges. They're not going to be definitive. I don't think my challenges here on Dave Superpowers are definitive. I'd encourage him to respond. I'd encourage him to come debate me. If he's more right than I am, then he should be able to explain, for example, the one the one little objection I brought up there about TEFE, and I just barely, that's just anything, you know, just barely getting anywhere into it. I'd also point out that which pattern is best for me is wrong because it's actually which pattern is best universally. Assuming a disinterested calculus, which pattern is best? Now it's a knowledge function so there's no calculus actually going on, it's just you knowing which is best, but it's absolutely the universal knowing, not what's best for me, that's SI. So SI is very concerned 
with what's worked for me in the past and what's hurt me in the past. SI very strongly remembers getting burned when you backed into the stove. And it much more weakly remembers not getting burned when you back into the stove. It's linked to me. SI says, yes, it's, we'd like to remember ideation, uh, I, you know, metaphysical work, data, you might say. Um, but it's not generally, doesn't answer the question, how is the data organized? SI is a manner of, of it's, it's a manner of not just organizing data, although there is memory and it's organized a certain way with SI and a different way with NI. Um, but it's also the real-time experience. You've not accounted for the distance between real-time and turn-based. So, again, you start running afoul of things. Why? Well, because you have to, if you don't account for those variables, then you, you're going to you're going to get an approximation that doesn't ultimately hold water once subjected to scrutiny. Um, what is the data is SE gather? All right, so it's like he wants to reduce all of human attention to abstract attention or metaphysical attention because he's an NI dom. And as a consequence, he doesn't really get that there are attentional manners that are non con non non objective that are simply experiential can't be reduced to language and then that the attentional taxonomy has to account for those as well so what he has here are all all meaning processing functions he doesn't say that, that you know extrovert sensing is a is a doing function in the physical world the process of which cannot be reduced really to to words meaningfully um, digging a hole is not a very good expression of actually digging a hole. Actually digging a hole is very hard and tiring and makes you sweaty and all that kind of stuff. It takes a long time and makes your muscles hurt and it's very experiential. But the words digging a hole are very easy to say and understand without actually conveying anything of 99% of what it means to dig a hole. So those are just some initial critiques of Dave Superpowers understanding of things I would say regardless of how objective a person's attempt to um, oh, that's not it no matter how objective a person's attempt to to type is their attention towards a disinterested calculus is a prima facie burden that doesn't really get you anywhere. So, yes, it's important to be objective about matters of typing. And once you're objective about matters of typing, it's possible then to correctly type yourself. But it doesn't, in and of itself, make sure you've been correctly typed. It's just, it, that's, where, that's where you need to account for the observer. Each observer comes into it with their own illocutionary purpose. Um, yeah, ACL. I don't think that was his name. Whatever. But, um, anyway, this has gone on long enough. That's my basic presentation and critique here. Um, there's plenty more to understand about cognitive functions. I have no problem laying it all out for everybody what my position is and having you guys I offer the same sort of critique to my position as I've offered of Dave's here, or I've begun to. He's wrong, but he's righter than a lot of people, and his wrongness is is interesting. It's kind of like Lamarck, and you know, time proved Lamarck more the wiser visionary than Darwin, anyway. Um, but yeah, it's. He thought that lady was INTJ. He thinks, if I've heard from a commenter that Dave Superpowers considers himself NIFI. And, of course, that's not how cognitive functions work. There's a reason why you can't follow a knowledge function with a judgment function. And it has to do with axes well, of and the nature of. to be NI and FI. The nature of slot mechanics. And, uh. I would say. Well, I guess before you were INFJ, you could be INTJ, I guess. Uh, I think you're probably INFJ, though. 
Um, although you've got good TE, you certainly got a lot of data presented, but your presentation's so good. I mean, it's hard to say. I, I need to talk to you live in person for a while instead of just critiquing your scripted videos. So anyway, that's my uh, critique of Dave's superpowers. To the extent that those of you out there think he's correct and I'm wrong, you know, like I said before, I stand here ready, willing, and able to debate the subject of cognitive functions with anybody, anywhere, anytime, their <laughs> turn for mine, <laughs> and I will win, and I will prove myself correct, or I will lose, and I will go back to the drawing board. But until somebody is willing to step up and actually do battle with me and establish that their vision of this thing is more correct than mine, to the extent that it disagrees with mine, then I will continue to uh, to stand in judgment of others who put out things that don't withstand as much scrutiny as the affirmation that, that I present. Ergo, good night. Don't forget to eat plenty of cheese. And come on, bring it. Bye, honeys. Mm-hmm.